Hello everyone and welcome to our online version of worship on this third Sunday of Epiphany or January 23rd. Yeah, third Sunday of Epiphany. Epiphany is always about having an aha moment. It's like if you have an epiphany, it's like, oh yeah, now I get it. Now I have some insight or now I know what to do. It's like guidance, isn't it? This text today we're looking at from Nehemiah, kind of an unusual text, but it's about a whole group of people having a sense of God speaking to them individually as well as a group. Ezra starts to speak, opens up the scroll, and the people have this aha moment. It's one of the most common ways that God speaks to us is through the scripture. But how do you know when it's God? How do you know when it's not just somebody else's idea? We're going to be looking at that this morning. God's guidance, how to discern and how to listen. A reading from Nehemiah chapter 8. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. And they told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. It was on the first day of the seven months. He read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people and when he opened it all the people stood up. And then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great Lord, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe and Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those from whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our God, and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. A somewhat unusual passage this morning. Probably haven't read the book of Nehemiah lately. Uh, but I'll tell you where I'm going with this in advance. We're going to be looking at how God communicates with us. One of the most common ways that God uses to guide us, to correct us, to communicate with us is using the scripture and uh, that's what I want to look at this morning how do we know uh, that it's God communicating and it's not just someone else's uh, personal opinion or they're reading something into the passage and then they're telling you um, how do we discern what is God's voice, so to speak. When I talk about God's voice, I'm not speaking about an audible voice, but I'm talking about knowing, a sense of guidance. How do we know that? How do we learn how to recognize that? How do we learn how to discern that? That's what we're going to be looking at in this passage today. Lessons from the ancient people Israel. And uh, since this passage is the narrative is halfway through the story. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to the story that we just read. Um, 
And the background is, now we're going way, way back. This is like um, 600 years before Jesus was born. So this is an old, ancient, ancient text. But the ancient people of Israel had this, um, not just ancient Israel, but the peoples of old had this practice where if your country was attacked by enemies and if your enemy defeated you, they would basically transport you back to your captor's land, right? It was like, it was like this forced migration. So if I was a part of ancient Israel and the enemies would come from the north and come down and they would take over and we would be defeated, you, you could basically be stolen and taken back to enemy land. And that was called uh, being exiled because there you would be, you would be stuck in this enemy's land and it could be for decades before you would be set free again. And this theme of exile occurs time and time again, and it really shaped ancient Israel's history. So there's many different exiles. As you start to read through the Old Testament, you'll come upon many different exiles. Now, some people thrived during exile, people like Daniel, the one with the lions from Sunday school, for those of you who are in Sunday school, and, uh, and then some, of course, would just be pining and miserable and desperate to get back to their homeland. Because, uh, you know, when you were exiled, you were taken away from everything that was familiar to you. It would be a different language. It would be a different religion, different customs. You could have been separated from your family. Your family might be back in the old country and you might be the one that was chosen to be exiled. I mean, it was really quite a traumatic, terrible thing to happen to people. And this story takes place um, when the ancient people had been, uh, that about seven, that had, they had been in exile for 70 years in Babylon. And uh, that's a long, long time. So the ancient ones had been in Babylon for 70 years and they were allowed at this point in the story to return to the homeland. I won't go into all the background, but Cyrus of Persia uh, came in, uh, defeated Babylon, took over and said to the exiles, okay, you can go back, you can go back. You don't need to stay here anymore. You can go back to the homeland. Uh, you can rebuild the temple. You can rebuild the temple's walls and you can actually take, for those of you who want to go, you can go back to your homeland. And so this was the dream for many of the people. And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, their prophets, led the way and they eventually did go back to their homeland, to ancient Israel. They rebuilt the walls, they rebuilt the temple and slowly the people started to migrate back in to uh, ancient Israel. So we pick up the story when the people of ancient Israel, the exiles, return to the homeland and uh, the walls are rebuilt. And once everything is sort of halfway decent, you know, the walls are built, the temple's built, Ezra uh, decides to call everyone together into the town square. And he this, he reads from the scroll, the Torah, which we call the first five books, basically, of the Old Testament. Now, it's been 70 years since this happened. They couldn't do that back in Babylon. That's a different religion, different land. They weren't allowed to be reading Torah. Uh, so this, is, this has never been done for decades for the people. And uh, really, only the older people although only the people over 70 would perhaps have any memory of having uh, to hear God's word being spoken out loud. Remember in those days too, literacy was only two or three percent. So the way that the message was passed down, the way that truth was passed down, wisdom was passed down, stories, history, was oral tradition. 
Everything was passed on from word of mouth. So only the well, highly educated could read for one thing, and it would be terribly expensive to be able to own a scroll. So everything was passed down orally. So Ezra the priest uh, gathers all the people together in the town square, and he reads from early morning until noon. And the people are absolutely rapt attention, riveted. And uh, he stood on a wooden platform and he starts to read the Torah and he starts to give an interpretation. So he's kind of filling it in. What does this mean for us? Kind of like what I'm trying to do every Sunday. Takes a piece of scripture and then he adds interpretation. This is what, this is what it means. And uh, so there they are. <laughs> this is kind of amazing because he keeps their attention for hours and hours and hours. And not only does he keep their attention, which is like the preacher's dream, but they start to respond and they start to weep when they hear the words of the Torah. And the text tells us that men and women and children, so it's men and women and children, all who could hear and understand began to be affected by Ezra speaking out the words of the Torah. And not only do they start to weep, but they also, their whole body gets involved in this because they're really moved by this. And so they stand up. You know, when something really gets your attention, you've got to stand. And not only that, they start to raise their hands to heaven. I mean, so it's like a sign of surrender. It's a sign of dependency. And they start to weep. And all of this is happening for hours and hours on this particular morning. And uh, there's no check in their phone here. There's no check in their watch. There's no wondering how long is this going to go on? This is so, it's such a long sermon. Is it? No, there's none of that. It's like it's truth starts to descend. And it really starts to touch and move their hearts. They would hear things like, oh, well, they would have heard all the major stories, of course, of the Torah. They would have, I mean, we don't know exactly all what he read, but it would be, I mean, they would have heard the commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought your ancestors out of the land of Egypt. They would have heard about Noah, where the world was going to rack and ruin and God saved Noah and his family in the midst of terrible chaos and, and storms. They would hear about um, Abraham and Sarah being promised that God would lead them to the promised land. And not only that, but their descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky. And not only that, that the stars in the sky and all their descendants would bless the earth, the cosmos. Everything would be changed because of Abraham and Sarah. They would hear all these old, old stories. They would hear about Joseph being rescued. They would hear about Moses. And all of these stories have one common theme. And the common theme that runs through all of these stories is this. That when God's people get in a mess, usually by their own doing and their own choice, faithful God is always there to rescue them and pull them out and help them to start all over again. And I, when I saw that theme, I thought, I wonder if they were weeping too because they, they, they saw, oh my goodness, God's rescued us the way that he rescued our ancestors in the past. Through all, no matter what happens, God is faithful, even when we are not faithful. Even we, we don't even pay any attention, God is faithful. So Ezra's standing there and he's just reading through all these, all these texts that, that, that show the, 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 the nature of God, really. The nature of God when people get in terrible trouble for various reasons. Sometimes it's not their own fault. Sometimes it's somebody else that's coming into their life. 
But the theme that runs through all of these stories of Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Joseph and Moses is always one thing. Whether you're faithful or not, God is always faithful. Whether you mess up or not, God is always in the business of calling you and restoring you. And people just wept because they had just been recently rescued themselves from Babylon. You would have read things like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. Of course they're going to weep because who's, I mean, they're probably sensing that they haven't really loved God well. They haven't really trusted God well. I mean, it's really hard to trust God when you're in exile, when you're in a country, in a place that you don't even want to be. And your heart's longing to be somewhere else. It's very difficult to trust when you're not in a place or a situation or a position where you want to be. And you're always looking over there. I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back home. I don't want to be here in Babylon. It's hard to love God with all your strength and your heart and your mind when life is tough. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they were like us, the ancient ones. Sometimes they honored God with their choices and their decisions, and sometimes they didn't. And sometimes they trusted, and many times they didn't, particularly when they were suffering. Because it's very hard to trust when you're suffering, isn't it? And I would suspect that they're weeping too because when they hear God's word, they would realize that their priorities were a bit off. Their priorities were wrong, in other words. I mean, that's another thing that causes people to weep when they realize that they're really bringing trouble upon themselves because their priorities are wrong. They're putting all their time and all their energy into things that ultimately don't really matter. And God is way, way in the background somewhere. And they don't really have time for God. That's a common thing, isn't it? That we can put God to the side. And then we can go on with our lives and go on with our jobs and plan our future and do all sorts of things and not really pay too much attention. That can happen easily. We don't necessarily notice it until things start to fall apart. And then we think, well, maybe... Maybe things are falling apart because I haven't put God first. Maybe my priorities are wrong. So I wonder if, if some of that weeping is about regret. You know, when Ezra's reading the Bible there, what we call the Bible would be the Old Testament. Ezra's reading the scroll. I wonder if what they're, and, and they're hearing and they're, something's convicting them because they're crying, they're standing up, they're raising their hands. I wonder if some of it's regret. It's like, oh, look how faithful God's been over the centuries. Look how, no matter what happens, how God's always been there for our ancestors. Through it all and all the ups and all the downs, whether they were in exile or whether they'd be coming out of exile and settling back in the land again. Wish I had, wish I had trusted more. Wish I, I wish I had trusted, I wish I had not stressed and worried and that's how we would say it today wouldn't we i wish i had done that yeah so when these ancient hebrews heard the word what really happened is and i think this is how you know when god speaks when the hebrews heard this when they heard the scroll being read clarity and understanding came to them it was like the aha moment it was like this is true this is really touching me because this is true for me. And I think this is how you know it's God speaking. You're not coerced into believing something. You're not coerced into, you know, somebody pounding you and telling you this is the way, this is truth. It's, it's an inner recognition. It's like, oh, yeah, that's true. That's where, I've, that's where I've gone wrong. Well, like if it's a conviction, for example, like if you're off base, it would be a sense that you hear something that's true and you say, you know what, that's what's wrong. I've been putting my attention on this. I've been putting my energy on this. And I should have been 
looking at that. That would be an example of how you would discern the voice of God or the speaking of God or the leading of God. And, uh, you know, and often when that happens, when you do sense that you are off base in some way, it can cause a, it strikes a deep chord and it can cause a sort of a grief. It's like a spiritual grief, an emotional grief in a way. Paul in the New Testament, the apostle says, you know, the word of God is active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the bone and marrow. He's saying it really cuts through all the pretense. It really cuts through uh, rationalizing. It shows you what is true about yourself and about your situation. Sometimes that's hard to hear. Sometimes it's a relief to hear. Sometimes it's difficult though. Yeah, it cuts through the pretense and it reveals truth, you know, that we're not self-sufficient. We were never supposed to be self-sufficient. God doesn't expect us to be self-sufficient. Yeah, it's like we're not created to go alone. And, and if we try and do that for too long, like the ancient people, we can get into all sorts of trouble. All sorts of trouble. And so the word has a way of cutting through all of our pretense and bringing us back to what's real. And so the ancient ones wept. It's like, oh, wow, I see what I've gone wrong here. And it, brings, it can bring you to tears. I mean, any change can bring you to tears in a way when you think about it. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to make changes in your life, doesn't it? If God points out, or if you sense that some big change needs to be made, that can be a bit alarming. It can be a bit overwhelming, can't it? It would take courage to tackle forgiving someone you can't forgive. That would take a lot of courage. It would take a lot of courage to trust God when you feel like nothing is changing and you don't like your situation at all. And you've done everything that you can do and there's no options left. That would be difficult. By the way, that was the situation that the exiles were in for 70 years before they got freed. They had to learn how to trust while they were in exile, while they were in a place that they didn't want to be, in a situation they didn't want to be in, with a heart that was longing to be somewhere else. That's hard if you've ever experienced anything even remotely like that, right? The word tends to, or God's speaking, or God's communicating, communicating it tends to, um, the truth of the matter surfaces. That's when you know it's God. The truth of the matter begins to bubble up and it surfaces. It's that sense of, yeah, that, that's true. That is me. That is true. This is what I need to do. This is how I have to change. And it's a, and it's a deep sense of, it's not just because somebody's telling you, though. It's not like a nagging of someone telling you. It's more of an inner knowing. That's important. It's an inner knowing. You know it. And it could be anything. You could be in a mess because... Um, I don't know, you could be miserable because you didn't step out in faith and you should have. Or maybe you stepped out and did something before checking on God and now you're in a mess. And now you're living with the regret of making the wrong decision. That's difficult. Maybe you're unhappy because you look to a particular person or a particular job to give you everything you needed and you find, well, it's just not working and it's just not enough for me. No, there's different kinds of exiles, isn't there? Really, when we're talking about an exile, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a location. It's that sense of being in a place or a state of mind who you'd really rather not be and you want to be somewhere else. Um, maybe you invested in the wrong relationship for way too long. That's a type of exile, isn't it? Or you trusted 
the wrong people or the wrong person and now you're living with the consequences of that that's difficult because you're sort of in a place where you don't really want to be yeah there's 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 lots of different ways that we can uh, we we can find ourselves in lots of different kinds of exile um, it's like different choices, circumstances beyond our control are a type of exile. Grief can be an exile. Uh, feeling stuck. Just feeling stuck can be a type of exile. Not knowing can be an exile. Guilt can be an exile. Sickness. Your body isn't working the way that you need it to work. That can be an exile. I mean, the scripture certainly points that God is in the business of calling us out of exile. But I say that with great caution because it can take a long, long time. I mean, some of these people, they were there for 70 years. It's not like it's a quick thing, right? It's not like it's quick. It's like God meets us when we're in the exile or when we're called out of it. Or even when we're going into it, for that matter. You know? And again, this isn't just about a physical location somewhere, although it can be like the ancient people uh, in Babylon. Um, it's not just about physical location. Exile is really a state of mind. It could be a spiritual state, actually. It's bigger than that. It's, a, it's like a spiritual state. You're stuck in a job you don't like. You're stuck in a living arrangement you don't like. You're in a house you don't like. You're in a town you don't like. Um, you could be in a place of just plain confusion. You're feeling a bit lost. You have a lack of direction. These are all places of exile. An exile is something that you want out of when you're looking for some kind of freedom. That's when you know you're in it. You're longing to be set free. It's challenging because it can take a long time coming. As any of us have known who have, for those of us who have ever waited for something, right? We've waited on God, we know that that can be incredibly trying. It's very difficult to trust when you're waiting, especially if your wait is over a period of years. Maybe something for yourself, or maybe you're waiting for someone else, you're praying for someone else. So, yeah, it's difficult. Exile is not an easy place to be. Um, when we're in that place of exile, just like the ancient people. God never left the ancient people when they were in exile, by the way. God used that time. God used that exile to get their attention. And eventually the plan always was to redeem them, using the biblical word, to call them back, to bring good out of it in some way, to bring them back. So the history of exile is always for redemption. I mean, in, in the sense that it's, I'm going to use it for your goods, God's saying. I'm going to take this mess and I'm going to use it in some way, some capacity for good. It's hard to trust that though when you're in exile. It's not easy. And then, of course, when the exile was over, the ancient people had to start all over again. They had to start at the beginning. And Nehemiah told the people after the exile, now look, people, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You've got to watch where you get your security. You have to watch where you get your joy. It's the joy of God that's your strength because God's the only one that never changes. Everything else changes. Everything else comes and goes. Everything. We come and go. Towns come and go. People come and go. Jobs come and go. Communities come and go. Everything else is up for grabs and up for change, right? Everything else, everything is temporary. There's one thing that never, ever changes. 
Nehemiah says, look, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what you have to count on. That's what you have to hold on to. In the midst of great change, whether you're stuck in the middle of an exile, whether you slowly see yourself coming out, whether you see yourself as starting new, something brand new, it doesn't really matter what stage we're in or where we are. Nehemiah is saying, now remember, it's the joy of the Lord that's your strength. Why? Because that's the one thing that never fails. That's the only thing that never changes. Everything else changes. Everything else changes. And what is solid is, Nehemiah is saying to his people, through it all, through it all, God is with you. When you were in exile, when you were first sent away to exile, God was with you. When you were in exile, God was with you. When you were brought out of exile, God is with you. When you start fresh and new, God is with you. That's the only thing that doesn't change. Everything else is up for grabs. Everything else changes. That can cause great alarm. It can cause great insecurity, which it has often does for me, actually. Or you can start to place your hope on something more solid. Hold the other things lightly. Just hold them lightly, you know? Not, not depend on them as much so that you always have that strong sense of foundation that no matter what happens, God never changes. And the joy which is a choice, by the way. The joy of the Lord is a choice. It's not a feeling. I choose to trust God at this time, whether I'm right in the middle of my exile, whether I'm coming out, or whether I'm starting new. One thing is I am choosing the joy of the Lord is my strength because through it all, God is with us. Amen.